Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, delighted that you can come along for the first of the 2017 Google for Education webinar series. Um, my name is Chris Hart, and I am a Google Certified Innovator. And I am delighted to be here with you today to share some ideas around uh, you know, one of those really important themes, which is getting our time back as people who work in schools, educators, administrators, etc. So um, I'm going to show you some, hopefully, some great tips and some hints about using G Suite and um, and really, you know, being using it efficiently and also super effectively as well. Um, if this is the first time you've joined a hangout um, uh, on a, um, a sorry a webinar like this, um, then there are a couple of things you should have a um, think about. If your video is really really blurry and awful. Um, if you go and have a look on the cog on the bottom right-hand side of your YouTube window, you can click on that and you can choose a higher um, setting for your video quality. So something like 480p or above would be really great. I think it defaults to the lowest setting available, so it can look a little bit blurry. Um, can you um, also, uh, I can see, in fact, some of you already are. You'll see I keep glancing across to the side to check out the chat. Some of you have already jumped in the chat, which is wonderful. Um, some people who I've never met before and some very old friends, even all the way from England. Good morning, Jamie. Um, so yes, yeah, so please feel free to put things into the chat. If you've got questions, I'll try and keep an eye on the chat um, as we go through. But let's get started. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick screen share and then jump onto uh, my slide deck over here. So just to reiterate um, that uh, if you haven't yet already done that, the cog wheel on the bottom right of your uh, video screen, you can change the setting up to 480p is pretty good, or even 720p um, would be great. If you wish to actually jump onto the slide deck for today, there is a link here in the uh, on the slide, or indeed, if you have a look on the channel on the description, um, just as you go underneath the video, you'll see the title and then a description. There is a link to the presentation slides there as well, so you can jump on the slides. And there are some things for you to click on, so I really do encourage you to um, jump on them and uh, click along. So, the um, webinar today is called "Back to School: Retaking Your Time," and that's really, really what we're um, aiming for. We're trying because I know that you've all felt like this. Um, and this is a, um, I was lucky enough to go to an event a few weeks ago where Michael Wacker from EdTech team was doing a keynote and he had this visual about Tetris and he was talking about what it feels like to be a kid. And we all often talk about um, allowing children to fail and, and you know, we, we think it's a good thing. And it is a good thing. I, I do believe that kids become more resilient and certainly develop a growth mindset and some grit by being allowed to fail. But at the same time, he talked about this idea that in Tetris, things can pile up, failures always pile up, and in fact, your accomplishments disappear. So that we should never let kids um, get to the point where they fail so much that they actually lose the game. And that, that keynote that Michael gave really resonated so strongly with me. And I remember, you know, um, with the advent of email and things like that and using technology like in schools, this is sometimes how I felt, overwhelmed. So what I'm going to do, I hope, this evening is to share some, uh, as I say, some hints and some tips about how you can um, use G Suite really effectively um, to make your life a little bit easier so you get some more of those wins in Tetris. So I thank, Matt, I thank Michael for, uh, for that analogy. So the agenda is pretty straightforward. Um, we're going to, first of all, have a very, very short look at Chromebooks and the Chrome Management Console, um, because we actually do have a couple of brilliant webinars coming up uh, very, very soon. And we'll be looking at Chromebooks and Chrome Management Console in um, great detail. So we're not going to spend a huge amount of time on that, but I do want to flag that for you guys who are using G Suite and those of you who are using Chromebooks. We're going to have a look at mail and calendar. And in particular, we're going to um, have a look at prioritizing in mail and also making appointments in uh, calendar. We're going to have a quick look at Google Drive. And this, for me, is very exciting because there are um, two big um, new things happened in Google Drive. I mean, I say big. They're, they're very big for me, very exciting for me. And I think you'll enjoy them too. We're going to, looking at, we're going to look at assigning tasks and comments. But we're also going to look at templates and Team Drive, which is a, um, something new coming out in G Suite very soon. Um, we're going to have a little look at the Explore feature in Sheets, Slides, and Docs, which really helps you become more efficient with those products. And finally, we're going to have a, a short look 
at our Google Classroom, looking at assignments, groups, notices, and shared classroom. Because there are so many amazing tools within G Suite, um, and uh, the, the team who works behind G Suite um, and Google for Education and all of those engineers who develop these products, they do a wonderful job of um of making changes and listening to feedback and and the updating stuff and there are some things which might have slipped through or slipped under your radar which i'm going to highlight for you tonight so um let's have a look at chrome books and the management console first up so you know i am a huge huge believer um, of learning tools um, and the variety of learning tools that we have in the classroom, whether it is post-it notes, whether it is um, books and paper and drawing and crayons and all the things you see on the screen there. But as we know, the learning tool, which is incredibly um, powerful, um, which I guess is becoming more and more prevalent in schools, is an internet-connected device. Um, and one of the internet-connected devices that our schools are using, and there are some um, great schools, um, McKinnon, for example, down here in Melbourne, um, who've rolled out in their entire school, I think it's over 2,000 Chromebooks. And basically what a Chromebook is, is it's specifically built to work with G Suite. So it's an internet-connected device. Um, the nice thing about it for me is I remember planning my lessons um, back in the day, I guess, maybe 10 years ago or even a little bit less than that, and thinking when I plan my lessons and the kids are going to be using computers at any point, whether it was laptops or even desktops and in IT suites, I need to plan in at least a 10 to 15 minute activity while the machines boot up and log on. Um, and I know you lot will have felt that pain before, um, but in fact, uh, with Chromebooks, the boot up time is incredibly fast. I think it's about six seconds to getting from zero to, to hero. So the boot up time of using a device like Chromebook just wins back that time for you. Now, I, I know I have friends and colleagues who have actually avoided using um, computers because of that very problem, this idea of the, of the boot up time being really slow. The cost of Chromebooks is really, really accessible for schools. And um, again, I'm not going to go too much into this because we are very lucky to be having a Chromebook deployment expert talk to us on a future webinar, and they'll go through a bit this in a bit more detail. But what I really like about them is this idea of consistency as well. So you know the platform G Suite. You're probably on this webinar because you use G Suite. Um, and Chromebooks is a perfect natural extension in terms of hardware because you have that consistent window into using G Suite. And the Chrome Management Console allows your administrators to keep kids safe, to make sure that they're um, on the right, you know, they're accessing the right information online. It's highly secure and it is great for customization. So again, I'm not going to sit here and tell you too much about this. I just want to flag this up because um, there is a link here for you to find out more about Chromebooks. And on the 2nd of March, 7 p.m. Australian um, daytime, daylight time, and 9 p.m. New Zealand time. Uh, we will be having a webinar called Transforming Learning with G Suite and Chromebooks. And we will have a Chromebook deployment uh, person from Google speaking with us, and also um, Ben from Xavier College in um, Aubrey, who will be sharing his story. So I'm really looking forward to that one. So let's skip past the hardware and let's have a little look at some um, of, the, of the tools I guess you're using every day and to see if I can share a couple of tips to make them a little bit more effective. So Gmail. So I actually sat and stopped and I drew and painted this picture myself just as I was feeling overwhelmed um, by the amount of email that was coming into my inbox because we do get an incredible amount of email. And sometimes I think it's because some people feel it's an easy thing to send an email and they're kind of, uh, you know, they don't have to worry about it then. They've asked for something to happen and, and it can be too easy sometimes to send an email. So what I want us to do is to really um, look at how we can tame our email with a priority inbox, labels and filters. So I'm just going to jump out of um, this for a second and I'm going to jump across to a, uh, a test account I've got open here. And the reason I'm going to use a test account is, um, at least at this point, there's not a lot of email in here. And it also looks exactly like it will look um, uh, when you first start up your email. So you'll have something that looks a little bit like this. But you have some awesome tools in here which will help you to manage your email. And the first thing I want to do, and again, I'm just sharing with you what I like to use and what, what I find um, a, a, a good way to manage my email is I'm going to click on the setting wheel. So just actually zoom this screen in a wee bit and make it a little bit bigger. I'm going to set, click on the settings wheel. And then I'm going to click on settings. So it's settings and settings. 
And that then takes me into uh, this uh, screen here where there are lots and lots of different options. So the option we're going to look at, first of all, is Inbox. So I'm going to click on Inbox. And I'm going to change my Inbox type. I'm actually going to change it to um, a type which is called Priority Inbox. So what in Priority Inbox does is it organizes your email automatically for you so that at the very top of your um, uh, inbox, you have the important and unread. You then have all of your start email. So I star things I know I need to action, and then everything else comes underneath. Now, I don't want to use important and unread. I just want unread at the top. So what I'm going to do is change this setting to unread. And the reason I don't want important is just because um, what importance means is Google actually looks at your email, and if you've interacted a lot with that person, it will automatically mark it as important. So it sticks a little yellow um, tab on it. I don't particularly like that, and it's just a personal thing that I don't. I don't like those yellow tabs on it. I like to organize my mail myself, so I turn off my markers and I set my priority inbox to be unread, starred, and then everything else. So one of the very very rare times you have to remember to save something using Google is I click on Save Changes. And then I'm back into my um, email. So what you'll see up here is I've got all of my unread email. I've got all my start email, and then everything else. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. So I've been sending this test account some um, uh, email. So this one here, I'm going to read it. I'm going to say, more coffee. OK. Now that's not very important. So I'm going to go back into my inbox. And in a second, you'll see that this email is going to disappear down here because it's not of a it's not terribly important for me. However, this one up here, this one which is about a meeting, I'm actually going to um, star that email. So I'm going to click on the star here because I think that's actually quite important. So I'll have a look at it. Yep, so I'm going to have a meeting with Chris. OK, I've put a star in that, and I've done that here. Um, I'll jump back out. And then um, that will disappear down into this start area in a second as well. So you can see that the original email that wasn't important has gone up down here. All of my unread emails have stayed up here. And then my start email will disappear into start like that. OK, so essentially, I know that what I haven't read is going to be sitting at the top of my inbox. The next one down is going to be everything I start because it's important, and then everything else underneath. Now, if you are into stars and you like labeling things like that, you can actually go back into settings and settings, and you can go crazy. On the general tab, you can scroll down, and you can actually use all stars. And what that means is that if you click once, you'll get a gold star. If you click twice, you'll get orange. If you click again, it goes red, all the way through all these crazy symbols. So if you wanted to um, uh, save my changes, if you wanted to go into your inbox and you decided this meeting was not just worth a gold star, it was actually worth an exclamation point, you can click through all of those different stars and essentially organize them in a slightly different way. So you could have different, your own code in that. So that's one way to um, organize your inbox. And what's not important gets put down to the bottom. What is important, you can star and it'll sit there, and everything that isn't red will be at the top. Just in case I forget while I'm thinking, remember that nothing disappears in your Gmail. So you guys can um, absolutely and utterly use the search engine at the top here to look for emails. And remember, Google is based on a search engine. So this is a, a really great, very powerful search engine. It will find any word within your email and it will find that right email for you. If you click on the drop down menu, you can look for specific mail from specific people, look at the subject headings, includes the words, et cetera, et cetera. So there's, um, you never really lose an email, but I still think it's good to get your emails organized. So, what I'm going to show you now quickly is labels. And so, if you look down, if, sorry, I'll just do that again so you can see it. I'm on the left hand side here. Under compose, I've got more. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go down here to create a new label. And I'm going to create that label. I'm going to say um, meetings. Okay, So I create the label. And now you'll see that in my list under my inbox here, I've got a new label called meetings. I'm going to click on this little drop down arrow. And then I can actually give it a color. Now I want to color that label in red. So you can see now I've got meetings, and that has a red box next to it. So if I look at my um, emails again, this meeting here, which I've already started, I'm actually also going to um, add a label to it, which is meetings. Um, because what happens now is if I click on my um, filters down the side where it says meetings, it will filter out and it will find everything that I have labeled as being a meeting. So I can create multiple um, uh, labels. I can just click on more again. 
create a new label and let's do one which is social. Um, create that. I can even nest labels under labels, so I can do tons of different interesting things. Um, social, I'm going to do blue, uh, like that. So now I've got social, and I'm going to drag that and drop it onto the coffee. So now I'm, I'm actually labeling my emails, so I can filter them down very quickly. I'm also organizing them by unread, starred, and everything else, and I can use the search engine. I am going to show you one more quick trick in uh, Gmail, which I think is great, um, is this one. So I'm going to go back into my settings wheel. I'm then going to go into settings, and I am going to go to filters and blocked addresses. So here, I am actually able to create a filter. So what I'm going to do is if I create a, a new filter, I'm going to say if I ever get an email from Chris, yeah, um, and I could do other things. And if I if it had the subject word in meetings, so let's do. Um, I could do that, or I could uh, include these words. But if I just want any any uh, email that comes in from Chris, i.e. me, I feel a little bit like uh, Split. I don't know if anyone's seen that movie yet. A great movie from M. Night Shyamalan. But I'm, I'm kind of working in two uh, accounts here. I'm going to create a filter so that anything that comes from Chris at ULD Training, I'm actually going to star it because it's obviously going to be super important. And I could also apply a label. So I could actually apply. A label, and if I haven't, if I um, hadn't already created one, I might create a label for Chris. So I'm going to create that filter. Uh, that's it. I'm going to create that filter, and now any new uh, emails that come in from me will actually have that label applied to them. This Chris label, let's color it in green. It will be starred automatically and be sitting there waiting for me. So there's a really, really great um, ways, or there are lots of great ways to, to uh, I guess, personalize and to make more efficient your email. And so if you get an email from a person who you don't really want to re read that email, you can go into settings. So I get one from um, which I know will be important, but I don't really want them in my inbox um, because they're from like a salesperson. So I've got filters. I can create a new filter. So from that salespeople, I, I want to keep the emails. I don't want to delete them. I can create a filter and um, take them out of my inbox totally. So let's move swiftly on from Gmail. And I know I'm doing this really quickly, but I wanted to share lots and lots of um, you know ideas with you as quickly as I could. And if you need more help, you just need to click. Sorry. If you need more help, you just need to click onto the links on this slide deck. And remember, the slide deck is in the um, uh, description underneath the video there for you. So let's have a look now quickly at Google Calendar. And I'm just going to show you a quick trick. Now, I'm English, and I'm, great. I'm really glad to see my friend Jamie Portman who is um, in this video uh, webinar as well. And he is an Englishman. And as English people, we love to queue. Like, we love a queue. Um, and essentially, we see a bunch of people, and we'll actually just join the end of that queue even without knowing what on earth is going on. But one of the things we often have, what, one of the things that often happens, uh, I guess, in schools is you want to organize meetings with um, individual kids, for example, or even parents. So one of the things that um, I like to do when I'm working with kids is say, OK, from this time until this time, I'll be free. You can come along. You can book a, a, an appointment. Um, so rather than coming along and actually queuing up and waiting to see me, I can create appointments in Google Calendar. So if I go to a Google Calendar and I say, well, I know that tomorrow from, let's say, 9 AM until, let's say, 12 PM. I wish I was free until 12 PM. But let's just say, for argument's sake, I can create an event just by clicking and dragging. But I can actually create an event, a reminder, or I can create appointment slots. So by creating an appointment slot, I'm going to say, OK, this appointment is for a, um, a one one to one, so just a meeting, a one to one meeting to look at your assessments or something, so to go through your assessment. Now, I've only got um, 15 minutes per meeting, so I'm going to just put um, offer slots of 15 minutes, and I'm going to create that event. So, what happens is on my calendar here, it just looks like a block of time. But if I actually go and double click into the event, you'll see I have now got this rather long but very important link. It's a calendar appointment page. So what I'm going to do is I would copy that, and I would email it to my students saying, right, guys, can you please book an appointment to see me on Friday? And what they would do, and I'll just jump into my other account here, is they would post, they would paste this in. 
and it would open up on their calendar. And what they would see here is all of the appointment blocks that are available. So if, for example, I click on this one, that is from 10.15 till 10.30, brilliant. That's the one I'm gonna actually book. Um, and I'll just put see you there. Just click save. So this is my student who views this now, and they've said, then they've grabbed this appointment block, save it. And then if I go back to my calendar and have a look at that, let's just go back in here, you can see that that appointment has now appeared. So if I just click on the day view for tomorrow, you can see I've got an assessment, one-to-one -one assessment with Chris Hart. So using calendar, not just to remember to do your own um, events, but also to actually create an appointment slot can be um, extremely valuable uh, in terms of organizing your time and not wasting other people's time uh, too, I guess. So let's just jump quickly back across here um, because this is, I'm quite excited about this bit. This is very, there's a lot of this is quite new. Again, if you want more help on each of the, the tips I've given you, there is a link to some more information which will help you to, um, to deal with that. Now this is a new-ish thing in Drive, kind of came in at the end of last year and it's called Action Items. Now, um, Luke, who is head of maths at a school here in Australia, um, I was asking a few uh, colleagues and friends, you know, what, how do they get time back from Google Drive and what, oh, sorry, from Google Apps or G Suite? And I just noticed in the in the chat that somebody was, uh, uh, Kirsty, in fact, was talking, saying she never heard of G Suite. G Suite was the rebranding, the renaming of what was called GAF or Google Apps for Education. So thank you for clarifying that, um, Jamie and Kerry. So when I asked my friends and some colleagues about, right, what, what does G Suite do for you? How does it, how does it make your work more efficient? Um, Luke told me that as a faculty coordinator, the ability to have multiple people using the same document at the same time um, means that he can centralize all of the data from his faculty in one place, keep it up to date, and access it from anywhere. So this ability, which I guess if you guys are here, you're probably already using G Suite, this ability to use G Suite to um, collaborate any place, any time with your colleagues is wonderfully powerful. And I'm gonna show you um, a, a way that you can up the ante on that one. And action items is a, is a new, as I say, a new-ish feature within uh, Drive and Docs. And it uses named comments uh, to create action items which are then visible in Drive. So if you look here, you can see that there is, um, these are, there are some action items here um, on a within Drive so people can actually see where they've been given some um, to-do list, I guess. So I'm gonna sh I'll show you what that looks like in real life because um, that would be much more useful. In fact, so I'm just gonna jump across to the other page. Um, so my drive shared with me. So I have been shared into this meeting agenda. So I've got a meeting and a, um, agenda minutes here. So let me just make that a little bit bigger for you. So um, Fab, Diane, Chris, and Test are the attendees of this meeting. We've got some key outcomes for the meeting. We're gonna explore opportunities. We're gonna get some stuff done. We're gonna um, make strategy into reality, which is obviously a great thing to do as well. And what we might do is we're having a bit of a discussion about this and we're chatting away and somebody's keeping a minute, but we can all have this document open and we can all be looking at what's being said in the document and adding stuff in as well. And then we get to that really um, important bit, which is the actionable items. So test, which is the name of this account, has to collect some information. So by who, well, test is gonna do it, by when, next week. So what we can do is, I'm sure you guys know how to add comments. So we can actually, um, let's do another one of these and we'll do this one for um, Diane. So um, we need to survey the students. And Diane's going to do that, and she's going to do it by next week, let's say, as well. So a lot of work to happen next week. Now, at the moment, that's just some text within a doc, but what I could do is I can highlight Diane's name. And two things happen is I get a bubble here, which allows me to add a comment. Or if I wanted to add a comment manually, I could go to Insert and Comment up here. But let's just highlight Diane's name and click on Comment. Now. Why this is the important bit is I need to create what's called a named comment. And to create a named comment, you need to use the plus sign. And then you need to put in that person's email. So diane at ulvtraining.com. So, and as you can see straight away, what happens is this little, bum, this little button appears here. So what I could do is I can leave um, a comment for Diane. Can you please do this? Um, and she will get an email notifying her 
uh, that there's a comment there. But what I can do on top of that is I can actually click on assign. And what happens is that it's assigned, the assigned person is notified and they're responsible for marking a task as completed. So I can click assign and that will actually be uh, sent to Diane. And then Diane has to click on the button on this uh, tick here uh, to actually say, yep, I've done it, it's now done. So the ability to um, actually assign action items is a, is a really, really nice uh, feature in um, Google Docs now. So you need to create a, a named comment, so that means using the plus button and the person's email, and then um, an assigned, uh, click on assign to that person, and that person will get a notification in Drive and also by email. Do, they do the task, and then when it's done, they click, it's done, and it disappears. So a really, really useful way to kind of assign tasks. In all cases, even if you are, um, I, I, we're going to look at this in more detail in a future webinar, but I'll mention it quickly now. If this was a kid's piece of work, for example, using the comment features is, is an awesome way to highlight kids' work. I like to use the comment features, and then I actually like to video their screen as well, and we'll talk about that in a different webinar. But I can also say, you know, uh, add a comment here and, and say this, um, really like this, That's some kind, specific, and helpful feedback, really like this, blah, blah, blah. And then I can actually add a comment saying, uh, I'll send it to myself, make me feel good. Um, um, it will then um, it will then send me an email saying you know Chris has left left you a comment um, please have a look at the rest of the comments there so it's a great way to give kids feedback as well and to and to tell them that you give them some feedback so um, what we're going to have a quick look at now is um, we're going to stick with this idea of, of the meeting agenda in minutes for a moment but we're going to go to drive and most of you will have um, I think it's rolled through it came out last week but I think it's rolled through to most uh, domains now that you are um, able to actually now click on. So let let me just jump into my drive for a second up here. Um, I'm gonna I'm able to click on new. You guys probably know this if you're here, but new folder, new file upload, new folder upload, new Google Doc, new Google Sheets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, forms, all that kind of brilliant stuff that's in here. But you will now notice what what has appeared in the last week or so is this arrow. And you'll see that now, not only clicking on here will it create you a blank doc, you could actually create from a template. So when you click from a template, it will take you to your domains shared templates page. So on my uh, domain here, the two things I want you to look at is I've got these different templates I'm going to use, um, but also I've got the ability to submit a template here. So um, essentially, if I now click on this one, which is the meeting agendas template, I click on that and bang! I've now, I now can use that template. Uh, it's a brand new, it's a brand new doc, but it's using the template from the um, domains template store. So I just show you very quickly how I did that. I go to my drive, I go to new, and then I click on either Google Docs, so I can do a, from a template doc. I can also though do a template spreadsheet or even a template presentation. So for example. If you want your school letterhead to be available to people in your school, create it as a template, upload it into the um, domain templates, and then people will be able to access that. If you want to have um, template spreadsheets for assessment, for example, or even branded um, presentation slides, you can create this template, upload it to um, templates, and it will uh, be available for people in your domain. So just to um, uh, just to very very quickly show you where all that stuff lives. If you type in docs.google.com, I'm not sure if everyone knows this, but docs. Oh, huh. oh that's because I can't spell. That's okay. Docs. I don't want docs. I want docs. Docs.google.com. That will take me to within my domain because I'm logged in. It will take me to um, all of the docs. And uh, by docs, I mean the word processing docs. So all of the docs that I've got here. Um, and I can see all of my docs, but also there is the template gallery, which is um, the ones which are made by Google, which are really nice now. Um, so I can actually have a look at all of those, or I can look at my own uh, templates as well. So I can look at the general ones, which as I say, are, are really nice, a lot better than um, they used to be, I think, back in the day or I can look at my ones that I've actually created in the domain as well. Um, so you can do the same thing by going to docs.google.com, or you can go to slides.google.com as well. Um, 
and here we go. And again, you've got template gallery. So I've got my, I, I don't actually have any slide ones, but I could submit one, uh, but there are some general ones which are really nice now as well. So using those templates is a really, really great way to be more, much more efficient. So those docs that people in your group need, um, it's a great way to, uh, to easily create them now using Drive, New, and then you click on this little arrow to get from template. So um, I hope that one's uh, really useful for you. I just want to now show you, um, let's just jump back in here for a second, uh, something else which I think is absolutely phenomenal. That's, that's a template thing. Um, and there's the uh, link for help. It's this thing I want to show you, which is Team Drive. Um, so Team Drive, you probably won't yet have it unless you are an early adopter. If you want more information, there is a link here, and you can actually um, join. I believe you can apply still to join the early adopters team for this, um, because essentially what Team Drive is, and we'll, we'll go through it in a little bit more detail, um, is this idea that you know sometimes we create um, resources, and those resources that we share with our teams. We maybe create docs or um, slides or whatever, we share them with our team, and then we leave that team. So we change schools, or we go to a different district, or, or whatever, something happens. And if we decide to remove the sharing privileges, or if our account is actually closed, there's not a lot of point in really closing down the account, but if it were to be closed, then everyone else loses access to those documents that I have created. So what Team Drive is, is a way for you to create a folder which isn't owned by an individual person, but is actually owned by the team, which means that when somebody leaves your team, the docs that are in Team Drive do not go with them. And equally, which I think is really great, is when you actually go and have someone new join your team, is you can add them to Team Drive, and that means that they, instead of having to reshare everything with that individual person, they're added to Team Drive and means they can access everything within Team Drive. So I'm lucky enough to be an early adopter, so I'm going to show you what that looks like. So let me just jump back across to this user here. So if I um, look at share, uh, sorry, at my drive here, that's my stuff. Yeah, that's the stuff that I own in here, and I don't own a lot in here. This is because it's a test account. But you will see that now I have this thing called Team Drives. So if I click on Team Drives, um, you'll see that I have created one uh, drive called the A Team Drive. So if I actually enter that drive, you'll see changes. So it actually looks a little bit different. Um, to normal drive. So I'm now in team drive and I'm in the A team drive. I can click on this and I can add members. I can manage members. I can change the theme. So if I wanted to, I can click on a theme and very much like the new Google Forms and Google Classroom is um, this kind of selection of different themes. Let's go for a lighthouse because we're the A team. Select that there and that will change up at the top up here. So essentially what I, what I can do now is I can add a new um, document, and I could do it from template. Um, let's just add a new blank doc. And I'll give that a title of, um, let's say this is going to be our planning planning doc. So super important for our new project. So that's going to be our planning doc. Let's get planning. Now, if I go back into Team Drive here, you'll see that that has appeared. Now, at the moment, if I were to um, click on, uh, sorry, on this one up here to share this planning doc. You'll see that by at, by default at the moment, I can actually look at who has access. All of the team, the A team drive members automatically have access to this. Um, I can change that. So I can even drill down and say, well, actually, Chris is going to have edit access, Diane's not. Um, she's going to have comment access, for example, or whatever. Um, I can, but on top of having it within, sorry, on top of having it within my team drive, I can still add people from the outside, uh, from outside of my team drive to individual docs if I want as well. In the same way as you would share a doc from your drive, so you can see it actually does look slightly different to the way that you share a doc uh, normally from drive. So team drive, I think, is going to be really powerful. As I say, it's still in the um, prototyping, testing, testing. Um, uh, stage. So, um, so yeah. So, um, sorry. I'm just seeing that there's some questions coming through. Um, yeah. So we're looking at some questions around. Um, 
for around team drive. Okay, so as for, I've been playing with this. So thanks, Aaron, and thanks, Marit, for your questions. I've been playing with this, and I've read a bit about it and, and played a bit, uh, played with it quite a bit. The idea is that everyone who's added to this team drive can. So let me see if I can um, manage members. Here it is. So what you can, what we can do is everyone who's added to this drive by default becomes a full member of the drive, which means essentially they can do everything. They can edit and they can um, manage members, upload, edit, delete files. They can do everything, I guess. So um, everyone has, so by default, there isn't one owner. It's actually everyone is an owner. Everyone has got full access to it. And that's kind of the great thing, I think, about, um, about Team Drive is that you know it, it's it's not owned by one person. If that person decided to to disappear, then um, uh, yeah, then you know they're not going to take it all with them because everyone still has access to it. So yeah, so I think that your question was, can is there a single person who can act as an administrator to control access? Yes, you could if you wanted to. Yeah, um, you said you you can. But as I say, there isn't an owner as such. Everyone has by default. Full access, but if you did want to change individual people to edit access, comment access, and view access, you could do that as well. Okay, okay, we still got quite a bit to get through, so I'm going to. Uh, oops, that's not what I, what I wanted to do. Um, I'm just going to skip back across to um, our next um, slide. And as I say again, on this on this slide 16, there is a link to give you some more information on Team Drive. I think it's pretty exciting. So what we're going to have a look at now is um, explore in Docs, Slides, and Sheets. I'm going to show you two, um, uh, two quick examples of Explore. So uh, let me just move on one. Um, and one of the examples I'm going to show you is actually using um, Google Sheets and creating graphs. And I just wanted to show you this with you. Blake, who is the IT manager um, at McKinnon High School in Melbourne, um, he actually uses Google Sheets to track the school's energy data. So they actually figure out how much energy is being used per, I think, they're, in fact, having looked at his website, they do it per child, and they divide up and see how much that costs. But they give that information using Google Sheets, this real data, they give it to maths and science classes to actually use and play with it. And they also update the public graph on carbonfreeclassrooms.com. So if you're interested in going carbon-free as a, as a classroom, then carbon-free classrooms is definitely worth a little look. So essentially what Explore does, and Explore is in um, Sheets and Docs and Slides, is it does some of the hard work. I guess it, it does some of the magic stuff that Google is so good at. Google's mission has always been to, um, to essentially organize the world's information in a way that makes it universally accessible and, and, uh, and I guess that you can find anything really. Um, and Explore is kind of a step towards that within Google Sheets and Google Docs. So the first one I'm going to show you is um, it was in Google Docs. You can click along. I hope I've set, done the settings right. You can click on this blue dot here, and it should open up um, this sheet for you. So what I wanted a um, student to do was to do some research into um, sharks. Okay, So um, what happens is, as you know, kids will do that thing where they will jump onto a tab like this one over here. And I'm going to actually add another column to this. And I'm going to say, OK, we're going to actually study the hammerhead shark. So what often happens is kids will jump onto here and go to Google, because everyone goes to Google to find the question and answer. They'll go for hammerhead shark. And they'll go for images, and then they'll grab an image, and they'll drag it, and they'll come along here, and they'll drop it into the image bit here. And that's fantastic, except it's not. Because what that child has done is they've gone off to Google Images, they've picked the first random image that comes up, and they do not know. We have no way of knowing if this is a um, an image they're allowed to use. So what they should be doing is going to Tools and Images, and usage rights and making sure that they are labeled for reuse. So when we're teaching kids to be great digital citizens, they, they at least now know that these hammerhead shark images are labeled for reuse so they can use them. Um, I haven't got time to do it now, but I do recommend you have a play around with the advanced um, search settings in images. You can look for different sizes, colors, transparent backgrounds, animations, things like that. It is a great thing which is hidden away under tools here. But even if I grab this image now, and I took it to my documents and dropped it in here. Let me just get rid of that the first one I got. 
Um, there's still an issue because I still don't know where that image has come from. Now, the child has done the right thing and found an image which is labeled for reuse, but I, don't, I do not know uh, where it's come from. So what I, what I would get kids to do is if you look down here on the bottom right hand, there's a little star icon in the speech bubble. That's the explore icon. So we click on explore. And suddenly, there's something really interesting happens. Explore actually does an automatic read through what you've already started to write. And it actually suggests some topics, and it suggests some images, and some suggested research to what has already been written in your document. But you can still go and do a search up at the top of Explore here. If I go for Hammerhead Shark again, I will get web information, images information, and even it will search my drive. Now, I don't think, oh, I have got some stuff on sharks. In fact, it's actually searched so well, it's even found some uh, underwater pictures that were taken when I was on the Great Barrier Reef, which looked terrible here, but thinking maybe it's a shark. But anyway, these are images which I, um, now when I drag this image in, so let me just delete this one that we, that we took without permission. Now when I drag this image in from this search, if I, I was gonna do it, come on. Try that one again, so add that image in. Oh, it doesn't like that one. Let's try this one instead. It wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't be a true tech webinar workshop if something didn't go wrong. Um, so here we go. We've inserted this image, and now if I click on it, I actually still get a link to the original image, and so I know where that image has come from. But beyond that, the other thing I might want to do is go into um, sources, and another thing will happen is kids will do some research. They'll jump on hammerhead sharks, go all go to Wikipedia, because that's the fun of all knowledge, and then maybe even go, here we go, wrong, copy that, go back into shark research and paste that in. And bing, I've done, finished, done my work, and I can leave, or I can sit back and put my feet up. Um, but indeed, I think what we need to think about is what we're asking kids, if we're asking kids questions that they can just go on Google, then essentially we're not doing a really good job of getting them to think at a higher level. So one of the things, if you are doing research tasks, I would suggest is that you make kids or ask kids ungoogleable questions. So what do you like about this shark? So essentially I have to now go off and read, so I can look at my web, I can get to Wikipedia this way, and I can read this and think, you know what the thing, the thing I find really interesting? It has, um, I love the fact that it's, head is that shape because dot, 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 dot. so you actually get kids to do those ungoogleable questions rather than just googleable um, things they can copy and paste now they need to be able to, to cite their sources so I know that I read the Wikipedia article so I could go Wikipedia and I've read this article up here and what explore allows you to do is to click on this little quotation point here and it will actually cite that as a footnote for you. So you can see that it's added this number three, I'll play a little bit bigger. It's added this number three, and it's added a, a footnote referencing where I got that information from. So exploring docs is really lovely. It's a, it's a great way to help kids to, to support them in their research and to support them um, in citing information correctly. So um, I definitely highly recommend Explore within Google Docs. So um, if you jump back onto the slides and you want to click on this slide, on this Sheets icon here, I'm going to show you Explore in Google Sheets. So um, essentially what Explore does in Google Sheets, I, am, I love spreadsheets. I think they're super, super powerful, but I'm not always great at um, being able to figure them out. So um, there are a few tricks and things I'm going to show you in a later webinar about using um, spreadsheets to really track assessment data. Um, but essentially, here's a little bit of data for you to have a look at. This data here is about um, World Cup scores. And if I click on Explore, it does two, gives me two things, gives me two options. It gives me some analysis automatically. So it can say that um, teams, matches, and goals scored. So the number of uh, teams, matches, and goals scored over the years. Um, it gives me things like matches versus teams. So how many teams are involved. It gives me um, teams, matches, goals, and average goals. So in 1954, World Cup Switzerland has the highest value for average goals uh, and a value greater than most for goals scored 140. It even gives me a count of the winners. So when each, when each, um, 
each country can think of where there when each country is one. Now, if I like this graph, it's automatically generated. I can actually grab it and I can drop it here and I can resize it. Now, the cool thing about this graph is uh, I will, if I were to change, if I would change history and to say that actually, um, you know, let's have a look. If I was to say that France didn't win, um, that sorry, where's France gone? Because they didn't have much. If France didn't win this one, in fact, Brazil won it. Um, you'll see that. Oh, that's Brazil with a capital R. That's not what I wanted. Um, they see Brazil won it, then it will change the graph automatically. So France has disappeared and Brazil's got an extra match. So I've just changed history. The other really interesting thing is if I go back to slides and I just show you here, because Explore also exists in slides um, here, and it helps you to create interesting layouts. But if I wanted to insert a graph into a slide, and this is a, a new, quite a new thing in, um, uh, in slides, is I can grab a chart from a sheet. And this is what Blake's quote was about before, is I can actually grab a chart from here. I can get, that's like one we just looked at. And it was linked to the spreadsheet. So what happens is that um, now, even though this is built into a, either a, a website or a slide deck, is that it will automatically, because it's linked, if I change the data in the spreadsheet, so let's do that again. Let's say that um, the winner here was, in fact, France. You'll see that this graph here will change. And if I go back to my spreadsheet um, in a second, he says, oh, I'm sorry, he changed, I think. Um, the actual graph will change. So even though you don't have to go in and, and delete this one and put a new graph in, it will actually update all of um, all of the graphs that you embed automatically if you update the sheet. Okay, so Explore gives you all of that, but it also lets you look at ask some questions. So I'm just going to show you quickly. Um, here is maybe some um, de-identified de data about some um, some results. Um, but I could say up here, I could say right. Can you tell me the average? Oh, in fact, um, high high score. Um, mid-year exam. So I can ask that question, and it will actually find me what was the highest mid-year exam score in 100, in 100. And it will also give me related questions, like what was the average mid-year exam score? And I can get that as well, 72%. So there are some great things in, in Explore which allow you to play with data and, and automate and, and make it a little bit easier to, to use data in that way. So. Um, I'm very aware of the time, so we're going to keep moving. Um, we are, we've are we looked at Explore in Sheets and Docs now. Let me just delete that so we don't get too confused. And the last kind of big thing I want to show you guys is some stuff around Google Classroom. So Chris, who is a, a humanities teacher, um, he t I asked him about Google Classroom and what, and what does he like about it. And he told me that Google Classroom allows me to track learning progress, monitoring students learning in real time, and develop students who are courteous digital citizens. Student learning is enriched through Google Classroom as they can receive timely feedback on their responses in a safe digital environment. So I couldn't even, I don't think I could have said that better myself. So I'm just gonna kind of leave that there for a second. You'll notice because I've got the explore bar up in here, it actually gives me some suggested layouts I could use. Uh, I'm not gonna uh, use them at the moment. So I am going to spend a very short amount of time on uh, Google Classroom because we are going to run a webinar which is dedicated to Google Classroom. Um, but I'll show you a couple of things um, and a couple of new things in Google Classroom. So I'm going to jump into, again, I'm not going to spend too much, I'm not going to give you too much information here just because we're going to do a full webinar on this. But I did want to show you some of the new um, things in Google Classroom. So this is a test classroom where um, I've got four students in it and I've got um, my, my own account and also the test account are both teachers in it. So you know that you can actually have more than one teacher in a classroom, which is always a great thing. So how does this help me to be more efficient? Well, it's absolutely probably, well, no, in fact, it's not probably, it's absolutely the simplest and most effective um, LMS that I've used. Like it's so easy to use, really quick to do some fantastic things because it integrates so beautifully with um, G Suite. So. Um, in this about section, we've got a calendar in here, which the kids can see when things are due, when assessments are due, and stuff like that. Um, it's also where we put all of the, the stuff which is static, so like um, unit descriptions or 
um, you know, uh, information that kids need all the time, I would put it here, the class materials, because the stream, which is more of a blog, um, things do tend to get lost. But I do want to show you a couple of fabulous things which have happened reasonably, reasonably recently in Classroom. There are a few different types of posts you can do by clicking on the big plus button down here. I can do um, an announcement, I can do an assignment, I can create a question, or I can reuse a post. And I'm going to show you really quickly a couple of these and not go into too much detail, as I say, because we're doing a full webinar on it. But if I create an announcement, this is what I love about this, is I might want to say, um, so I'm a French, and I should have said at the beginning, I'm a French and Spanish and technology teacher by trade, but let's just say, remember to bring in your permission slip for the French trip. So um, what I can do is I can actually now, which didn't used to be the case in classroom, is I can add a topic to that. So I'm going to actually click on excursions as a topic. And if I wanted to, I could, in fact, even add from Drive the blank um, permission trip, the permission slip. Um, but what I can do now, which, which again is new in Classroom, and we will explore a bit more in our next webinar, is I can um, actually send it to um, lots of different classrooms. So if I had six different French classes, rather than just send who are all going to go on this trip, rather than sending it to just one class at a time and having to repeat the, repeat, repeat the announcement, I can now actually send my announcement to all of my classes at the same time. Um, if I didn't want to do that, let me just untick those, I could actually also send it to just specific learners in, um, in my class as well. And I'm going to show you a little bit more about that in a second. But this makes it super efficient to make an announcement. You could even do it as a video if you wanted to. So um, this is a, the, the idea of having topics now. It's a wonderful um, part of classroom. And the idea that you can now actually also attach um, notices, et cetera, and announcements to several classrooms at the same time is just brilliant. I'm going to show you if I were to do an assignment, and this is the thing that I know. Um, this is the thing I know has been, you know, has really got people. What's the word I'm looking for? They've been asking for this for ages now, essentially, because what ha what used to happen in classroom is when you created an assignment, you could only send out that assignment to every kid in the class. So what we were talking about, or what I was talking with lots of different teachers about, was. Well, what, what about if we want to differentiate those assignments or set different resources or different, even fully completely different assignments to different kids within a classroom? So what happens now is we do have that ability. So if I was to do, for example, um, let's have a little look. So we were going to do um, a research project. Um, and I've got some instructions. And again, I'm going to do this in much more detail in a future webinar, but let's say it's due next week. Um, and it goes under the topic of French, it's a French one. I can um, assign a document. Now I'm in the wrong, oh no, I'm not, no, it's good. So if I was to do, for example, in fact, I'll show you if, uh, Le Monde du Futur, which is one, um, the mode, Le Monde du Futur, that should be. Um, we got it. Yeah, so this is a, a rubric task and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm, as I say, I'm going to tell you all about that at a different point. I can actually say students, um, can I can make a copy for each student of this, so they'll get their own individual copy. But this one here has got different resources or it's differentiated, and I only want to give that to test learner three and test learner four. So I then assign that, and rather than every kid getting it, only the kids who I've assigned it to get it. And then I might have a different uh, version of that assessment task, which has different resources, um, and then I can assign that one to the other kids. So essentially, it allows you now to differentiate the assignment of um, or the posting of assignments by groups of students, which I think is a really, really powerful, um, a really, really powerful thing now within Google Classroom. So I'm just checking the questions. Um, da -da -da, Kirstie's interested in high school learning, but has it also been used for uh, effectively, oh, in fact, yeah, effectively in primary classrooms? And Marita said, yes, my son used Google Classroom in primary school, loved it. So did I as we knew uh, what they were doing. Also things like permission slips and notices were shared. Yeah, great, thanks for it. Yeah, absolutely, it gets used tons and tons in, um, in primary classrooms as well. Um, but if I was to just show you one quick, um, again, a new-ish feature in Classroom came out towards the end of last year, is I can actually now email guardians. So I can invite guardians to be a part of a class. So I might want to send, say, I am the father of um, 
test learner two, I might want to send. Um, I want to sorry. I might want to add them as a guardian. Obviously, if a uh, kid comes from or a child comes from a home where or they have they're not living with both parents or something, then you can actually add another guardian as well. So both parents or both guardians can can uh, receive information. And so if I invite uh, that person as the guardian, what I can do is I can in fact email all guardians, and what that will do it will send an email of a, a guard, sorry a, an email summary of all of the tasks that have been sent by the teacher in that class for that uh, week, I think it is, a weekly summary. And um, essentially it will say, this task has been set and Chris or test learner two has not completed it or has completed it. Um, so it's a nice way for you to be kept informed about what's going on. Um, and also, yes, and so using email, um, we can also email all guardians and actually send an email out to all of the, um, and I'll just open up in my, um, Gmail, I can actually send an email out to those guardians now um, directly from uh, Classroom. So Classroom is just developing and developing and developing and we're going to spend a whole webinar on it. So um, let's, let's, yeah, so whew, we got through a lot there in 55 minutes. I hope that wasn't too, too fast for you, but there are a couple more things I would love you guys to do um, or to tell you about, in fact. G Suite is, without doubt, as far as I'm concerned, um, a no-brainer in terms of the value it adds to learning, um, the you know the cost of it, which is zero, um, and the ability to actually help kids to become collaborative digital citizens, um, and to really you know to really lift learning and teaching to that next level using something which is easy, flexible, and really great to and just and just keeps developing, keeps developing, and it's an, an amazing resource. I can't go on enough about it. But keeping up with it can sometimes be hard, if I'm really honest. There could, because there's so much in G Suite, you can miss things as well. So what we've got, um, or what Google has provided, are, um, that is the Training Center. And the Training Center is a fantastic resource, and it has a pile of online content, including lessons, videos, quizzes, and it actually, um, it, it, it will help you greatly to improve your knowledge of G Suite. And it is linked, what I love about it, and um, I think is, is quite unique about it, is that it's not just about the technology, it's actually about the pedagogy and actually about learning. So I really, really strongly recommend you go to g.co forward slash edutraining, edutraining center, um, and have a look at some of the lessons in there. Because once you've done that, you could, and I would highly recommend it again, is to um, apply to become a certified educator. So there are two levels, a certified educator level one and certified educator level two. So you can, um, you know, you can actually uh, do some work on the education, on the training center, and then get certified for that. So there is a cost, I think it's 10 bucks for level one and 25 bucks for level two, but the, you, you get a certification and you get this badge that you can put on your email. I would really suggest that if you're a school and lots and lots of you um, um, are using G Suite and you want to actually build this into your professional learning, then you know you could use the training center to support you, and you could all go and sit your educated, uh, certified educator exams towards the end of the year, and then have a massive party afterwards once you've got them. Um, what I would also love from you guys is. Google for Education, Australia, New Zealand are delighted to be able to put on these webinars, but we want to make them as useful and as powerful uh, as possible. So I would be really grateful, and I know that the team at Google for Education up in Sydney would be really grateful if you could give us some feedback and feed forward. So there's a Google form which is linked to um, either, oops, either this link here, or if you click on the purple um, icon, it's linked there. It shouldn't take too long, just a couple of minutes, please. Um, it would be fabulous if you could give us some feedback and feed forward using that form. So our next webinar, which I am very, very excited about, um, is on the 2nd of March. It is 7 p.m. Australian time, 9 p.m. New Zealand time. Just to let you people in New Zealand know that you, know, you don't have to stay up late every webinar. We will be running some which are at 5 p.m. Australian time, 
and 7 p.m. New Zealand time. It is with, about transforming learning with G Suite and Chromebooks. And while today has been about looking at some of those hints and tips around how to make things more efficient, this one will be good, a much deeper dive into um, particularly the use of Chromebooks and G Suite. So you can use G Suite, G Suite without Chromebooks, but Chromebooks are an incredible device to just to make it more, um, I guess, less expensive, um, more consistent, all the things we said right at the start. And we will also be talking to Ben from Xavier College up in Albury. He'll be sharing how his entire school has gone down this route as well. If um, you want to connect with me, please feel free to. My Twitter is the handle is there, my G plus handle is there, and my website is there. I've had a lovely evening with you. I hope it's been um, of use. Please feel free to pass on the email with the um, registration details and get as many people as you can to register for these webinars. Um, have a beautiful rest of the evening. Um, take care, and I will see you soon.